<laughs> the ones that were on time, I mean, should not be punished. Uh, that's also a good information maybe for you all. Uh, this is going to be recorded. So if your colleague would like to uh, revisit that, we will send you shortly after the presentation the video link. Now, uh, we would not like to lose too much time, and I would like to pass uh, extremely fast then to Marcos. But before, just a, a little uh, look at the agenda. We will have several topics, but we would like to actually do that within 40 minutes so that we would have uh, five to 10 minutes Q&A at the end. With that, I would like to pass on directly to Marcos. Marcos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for, for joining our call. So you can see here the presentation. We're going to start a little bit with the current situation and an outlook. And then we will go through, I will go through the, the two funds, the classic and the natural resources. Then I will hand over to Carlos that will move to the chronic in, underinvestment in commodities. And finally, Urs and Alex will, will talk about Atalaya and some conclusions. So I will start with uh, some high level thoughts. Um, and in the slide number three, you can see a quote of uh, Benjamin Graham, one of the fathers of value investing. And what he says is something that can be applicable now. We've been two years with the pandemic, and now the war uh, or the invasion of Ukraine. So really, we are, uh, you know, uh, being surrounded by negativity, negative news, people talking about recession, about inflation, about war, about nuclear tactic weapons and stuff like this. And, you know, in the end, I think we need to take a step back and look uh, at the long term and the fundamentals. And you know, this, what, what Benjamin Graham was saying is, is very useful when uh, uncertainty raises. So abnormally good or bad times do not last forever. In the next slide, what is, we, are, we have um, put here a, a chart that we uh, often put when there is uh, uncertainty or, or we are facing crisis. And the summary of this chart is very easy, is that uh, the long-term investor in equities is immune to crisis. It's a headline which is surprising, but if you look at the events that have been taking place in, from the 60s in the last uh, 70 years, in the 60s, the missile crisis in Cuba, the assassination of the president, in the 70s, the invasion of Afghanistan, in the 80s, we had uh, also Russia, uh, Iranian revolution. So there's uh, in the 90s, we had the tequila crisis and the Russia crisis and 2000, the tech bubble. And then the, 2000, uh, the, the attack to the, to the September 11th in, the, in New York. So you see many, many, many events that you know at the moment were very negative. And you look at the dividends of the Standard & Poor's and they are every year paying dividends. Some of the years you get a higher dividend, some years a little less that is compounding at the six, seven percent per year. So, you know, the conclusion here is, if you stick to the long term, the stock market is one of the best investments you, you may have, and it yields six, seven percent per year over the long term. Um, in the next slide, I wanted to quote one of our references also, as you know, Warren Buffett, and what uh, Buffett always says is that uh, he wants to see many recessions, and basically what he says is when there is a recession or there is fear or there is uh, really uncertainty, Berkshire Hathaway uh, usually makes very good investments. So it's the same for us. This doesn't mean we want to see recessions, but in the current uncertain times, uh, you see and you find a lot of opportunities. And in the end, we need to step back and look at the future uh, with a long-term perspective. So quite a negative starting point, but what I want is to pass a positive message. If we go to the slide number uh, seven already, where are we in the cycle? So I'm going to go fast with the situation. We are in the last part of the cycle that started in 2009. So in our opinion, COVID-19 is in the last legs. We are convinced that China will manage it and it is managing it. Inflation in our numbers is peaking. In the next quarter, we will see the peak in inflation and it will moderate. Um, and this means that basically this is quite business as usual in the last part of the cycle because, you know, we have been in a cycle that started in 2009 that has been very long. Uh, so now 13 years, 
but with a lot of moves. We've had uh, the European crisis in 11, the Chinese recession fear in 15, recession fear in the US and current inversion in 18, the global pandemic in 20. So it has been a, an upward cycle, but really full of, of severe uh, market drawdowns. And now we are having another, another phase of uncertainty with the war and with the pandemic. The duration of this late cycle is normally three, four years. And I want to highlight that normally this late part of the cycle is good for value and good for commodities. If you move to the next slide, just a few words on China. So if you step back from the current situation and all the news and negativity about Shanghai and Beijing, basically uh, the, the GDP is probably troughing or has troughed in the past uh, quarter. There's plenty of measures that the government is starting to put, already started last year. So they have monetary policies, fiscal policies, infrastructure. In, they, they are also putting measures in order to favor a real estate market. So there's a lot of things going on that, in our opinion, will help the economy to make, I don't know, 4 to 5% growth this year, as you can see in the chart. And the negativity now is extraordinary uh, when you know the track record of the Chinese authorities has been very good in the past few years. Uh, on the, the other topic on inflation, in the next slide, you can see that uh, now in the news all over the world, we are having a very negative uh, comments about inflation. This is going to be 8%, 9% forever. It's going to be a recession. On our numbers, we are picking maybe this quarter or next quarter, and then inflation should normalize in 2023. We are not saying that inflation will go back to the levels of the past 10 years, but inflation in Europe is going to be 2 to 3% next year, and in the US probably a bit higher, between 3 and 4% next year. With all the things that are happening now, the war, raising rates in most of the countries, and some other economic stabilizers, uh, we will have an impact in inflation. So uh, we think we are in peak, in peak uh, inflation very near of it. And a final comment in the next slide over the current situation. I wanted to talk a little bit on Ukraine and, and the invasion. On the classic side, we are not exposed. We don't have any names in Russia or Ukraine. In the Natural Resources Fund, we have a 5% exposure in Russia, and we will uh, deal with it in the next few slides. I will go into, into details there. And just a couple of comments from a long-term perspective is that the war is, is accelerating three, at least three structural trends. One is defense. Defense spending is gonna be much higher and for a long time. Energy global reassessment is gonna be very, very important and also accelerate the transition and then reduced investment in non-democratic or high-risk countries, which, you know, uh, this will happen in the next few years and probably in the long term. And in that aspect, our two funds are somewhat exposed to these trends. Uh, in energy, you know, we are very much exposed. The same with metals and mining. We are exposed to defense in the classic with more or less a 10% weighting. And the flight to quality is going to be positive for us because we quality for us is very, very important in the both funds. So moving to the, to the classic, the classic has started well the year. Next slide, Alex, if you can. Yeah. Um, so yeah, last year we did 20%. This year the fund is up 15%, so doing well, and we are ahead of the main indices. So not too much to comment here. The good sectors, energy, mining, salmon, and defense, and negative industrials, basically, and a little bit of financials. The rest is more or less OK. In terms of companies, Thales, First Quantum, Hess, Greek Seafood have done fantastically well. And, uh, and uh, yeah, energy is paying off. Uh, you know that we are overly exposed to the energy sector in the classic. Uh, we've been there for several years, and now it is, it is paying back. You can move to the next slide. The intrinsic value of the fund adjusted now and, and revisited is 1815 euros per share. The fund is trading at 570, so still more than 40% upside. This is more or less should happen in the next three years, three, four years. The return updated is 14%, which is in the middle of the range. So we don't have the feeling that the fund is expensive. And you know, European indices are down, I don't know, 10%. The US indices are down on average, 5 to 10%. So basically, there's nothing mega expensive now. The fund is trading in a range which we find fair. So not expensive, not cheap. And again, we think we can make this 10% per annum that we have done for the last 
20 years. We did 9% for the last 20 years. Just let me give me 10 seconds to highlight again this. It is the magic of compounding of the long term. I mean, 10% uh, implies doubling every seven years, multiplying by four every 14 years, and multiplying by eight every 21 years. So this is the key uh, of making money in the, in the equities. It's a staying for the long term. In terms of holdings, this is a slide that we usually put in our presentations. This is half of the classic, 50%. So I want to just transmit that we, we are heavily concentrated, but also very well diversified. So this is the stakes and uh, just, you know, the four characteristics that, that we look always, which is business quality, good management, strong balance sheet, and a clear focus on, on the strategy. You can see in this half of the portfolio that uh, a big exposure is energy, oil and gas. Basically, we, do, we have you can see here three names. I think yes, Senovus, Suncor, and Harbor. And if you look, if you do a look through of, over these ten holdings, you find a lot of sectors: energy, salmon, defense, cement, support services, copper, plasma, and uh, cable. So, in ten names, uh, you see how diversified the fund is. Let me go fast to the investment case of the quarter. It is Butsi Unicem. So it's uh, an Italian cement producer uh, founded in, in 1907, Butsi family. It is run by the family also. It's mid-size, 3 million market cap, more or less, and a half billion sales. But they are big, eh? 14 countries, 10,000 employees, and 60 million tons capacity, basically in the US, Europe, and, and Latin America. They have some assets in Russia, so this is why, and Ukraine, this is why they warned in the beginning of the year. So they took a bit down 10% this year from 800 million to around 725 million. Why do we like uh, Bootsy? So, what are the positives? Basically, cement is a very good business. Uh, you know that, that we like it, it's uh, multilocal, oligopolistic, high margins, more than 20% a bit down. Alex, if you can pass to the next slide. Uh, it is very well diversified, as, as we stated. 60% is generated in the US, uh, in the EBITDA, with very high margins, and in the European business is high quality. The management team is good, so no, no critic there. Strong balance sheet, they're in a net cash position, and if you look at the valuation, it's a little bit ridiculous. The return on equity last year was 14%, and it is trading at 0, 0.6 times price to book. Only doing a very simple calculation and using eight times enterprise value EBITDA, which is the normal historical for the sector and for the stock, you obtain a share price of 33, 33 euros per share when the stock is trading at around 17. So it should be an easy double on mid, uh, mid cycle multiples. Free cash flow, 350 million euros per year, and this is an 11% free cash flow yield. So really, the, the stock is super cheap. But in the end, an investment case has always the negatives. So in a slide uh, 18, you can go to the negatives for our concerns. Basically, the concern is that cement is cyclical. And as we stated, we are in the last part of the cycle. So we have three, four years of good, good numbers. And then we will see probably a slowdown or a recession, maybe earlier, maybe later. And so this is a concern. But I mean, whatever happens, we can buy more shares. Then the CO2 emissions that everybody uh, is scared about uh, for this sector, in our opinion, is not very meaningful because they will be able to pass it to prices. So we are not worried about the uh, you know, polluting label that is put to cement. And finally, we have maybe some risk of M&A, the management, which is in cash and generating free cash flow could buy a company, but we trust them. Uh, we think that this risk is not meaningful. So net net, we have Bootsy in both funds, intrinsic value 30 euros, return on investment in our number 17%. We think we will make uh, good money here. Let's go to the natural resources, slide 20. Um, so this fund has done very well, as we expected, 40% last year, and year to date is more or less up 20. And again, let me just repeat this. It is only the beginning. This is just a commodity super cycle, which is taking shape, and we are just in the early innings or in the beginning of the cycle. Some people ask us, is, is it time to sell? And, and absolutely not. We are here for a decade. Okay, let's uh, go to the Russian exposure. We had three companies. Uh, we had um, Gazprom, 
Surwood Neftegas and Knowledge Nickel in the fund, and we have valued them at zero. So this valuation is now in the numbers and in the performance. And we think that in the future, we may be able to recover part of this. Uh, so the adjusted loss uh, right now, mark to market is around five to six points. Um, just in order to defend us a little, a little bit, you know, you go to the next slide, you can see that one of the problems of investing in commodities is the concentration of the reserves and the resources. If you see here, nickel is heavily exposed to Indonesia, for instance, copper is very much exposed to Chile and Peru, uh, coal to China. So you have a lot of resources that are in, in countries or in, in geographies which are uh, riskier. So, you know, Having been exposed to Russia is a mistake, yes, but we think that is within what we can tolerate because you, we could have problems in Zambia with first, quest, with first quantum or in Congo or in Indonesia. So it's not a defense because we are really not happy with what happened, but uh, it is, you know, it is difficult to invest uh, everything in a commodities fund in a, you know, in a non-risky um, geography. Uh, in the next slide, you can see the look through of the fund. So you know that we don't invest in commodities directly, we invest in companies, but this is the look through. And basically half of the fund is still in energy, 40% oil, basically oil. And then we have 15% in copper, nickel around 5%, uranium around 10%. The rest is spread between the, what you can see here. Salmon is, is a big position because the sector has done very, very well. And here on the on the slide, you can see how we try to add value, uh, you know, looking for scarcity, uh, avoiding measures, good reserves, safer geographies, close to production or in production, good balance sheets and good management. This is a way we think we can add some value to the to the indexes here. So the IRR of the fund is 13 percent. The intrinsic value is 190. The fund is showing at around 140, so there's still plenty of upside. Some of our investors ask us why there's no more upside on the intrinsic value. We wanted to explain this again, is that the intrinsic value in the commodity is in the middle of the cycle, but you know, when you go to the up part of the cycle or the downward part of the cycle, the vola or the amplitude is massive. So the intrinsic value is 190, but we always give what would be a peak cycle valuation for the fund, which is more closer to 300 euros per share. And this is the level where we want to reach. So basically doubling the current half. This should be feasible in the midterm because we think that this cycle will take many, many, many years and is now even accelerated by the, by the war or by the invasion of, of Ukraine. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit on the, on the fundamentals of a couple of slides on oil and then on metals. On oil, as you can see in the slide, inventories have been falling dramatically since uh, since May 2020, so two years, the delta in the fall has been one point, almost 1.5 billion barrels, which is basically a 20% reduction of the total global inventory since the pandemic uh, peak of inventories. Basically, in the past two years, the average deficit, deficit has been 2 million barrels per day. This includes OPEC cuts, so the deficit is including OPEC cuts. And now the last numbers I'm seeing, it's uh, more or less 1 million barrels a day of, of deficit. Okay, so also we need to highlight that now the US and some OECD countries are releasing reserves in order to offset the, the impact of the, of the war in Russia and Ukraine, which means that the oil price should be much higher with the, without these, these releases. And in the next uh, page, you can see the, 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 the spare capacity uh, which has almost disappeared as we we foresaw last year. We said last year that this would disappear in 2022, and it's uh, it's taking exactly what we said. By the year end, by 2022, the spare capacity will probably be for four million, three and a half, four million barrels. You know, in any sector, less than five percent spare capacity is full capacity considered. So from now on, any problem in supply, any acceleration of demand will lead to a spike in, in oil prices. So the sector has accelerated the, the transformation and we are moving to, to deficits for the next few years. 
So here is uh, in slide uh, 25, 26, sorry, you can see um, basically the, sum, the, the summary of what happens with the sector. The sector is now producing and consuming around 100 million barrels. We expect demand to grow in the next 10 years by around 7 million. And we expect declines uh, to reach 15 million. So then you may add some production that is expected to come in the next few years. But basically, the supply gap is between 20 and 25 million barrels a day. Um, the problem is the world has underinvested for already 10 years. Demand is, is very sticky and will continue to grow this decade. So we need incentive prices and the curve is moving up. So probably we are not talking about 80 anymore, right? we're talking about 90, 100, 100 dollars per barrel. And the problem now is ESG, you know, and financial discipline. It's very difficult to convince people to invest in this sector. So, you know, building a deep water field, 6 billion, 15 years, people do not want because of ESG, because of pollution because the uncertainty of demand. A lot of people think that demand of oil is going to disappear, which is not the case, but a lot of people think this. Let me talk in a couple of minutes on, on the next slide about the metals. Here, it's different. The metals are a bit different from, from oil in the, in, in the demand part, because demand is going to explode. You can see here that for only for the next eight years, only, I'm not talking about 2050, where really the energy transition will be in full uh, steam. Here we're talking about the, the initial 10 years, lithium demand to multiply by four, four point something times, graphite to multiply by three times, nickel by two and a half times, cobalt, copper by two times, aluminum. So if you take most of the metals uh, and some other commodities demand, is going to explode in the next decades uh, due to the, the energy transition. And in the next slide, you can see the copper, the copper market, just as an example. I put only copper and nickel, but here on the copper market, you can see exactly what is going on. What is going on is that the market has supply enough for the this year, maybe 2023, 2024, depending on the on the timing of the new projects, but there is greenfields or new projects coming for the next two, three years. After that, there is nothing. There's no really greenfields. Even brownfields are limited. So we are going to enter in a deficit of copper when the demand of copper is going to explode due to electrification. So this is no way back because now if we want to, set, to, to build a mine and we need the permit and we want to invest in copper, it takes, it takes uh, you know, a decade. So we are going to have several years if not decades of, of a deficit in copper. In the next slide, you can see exactly the same, the same vision for the, for the nickel market. In the left-hand chart, you can see the inventories that are more or less at all-time lows, similar to copper, by the way, that the inventories have disappeared now. And look at the price has a skyrocket. And if you look at the supply demand balance, it's exactly the same picture as from 2024, 2025, the market will go into structural deficit. And this is worse, not only the problem in the lack of supply, but also the huge jump in demand. So it's pretty clear that the cycle will be, will be quite long. So conclusions, um, you know, trying to sum, it, sum up everything we said, um, the natural resources, uh, it's well positioned on a, on a long-term super cycle. We think that there are two cycles in parallel. You have the normal commodity boom bust cycle that has just started, and then the energy transition on top of that. And then you should add also the Russia, the war, the war in Ukraine, because uh, this is going to limit also the supply of, of several of the commodities. So Russia produces more or less 5% of most of the metals, 10% uh, of oil, and 15% of gas. So it's a big player in the commodity space that now is going to, to stop or not stop, but slow down probably CapEx and, and projects. The energies are, are the, the cycles are different. The energy cycle is basically starting due to the lack of investment and the lack of supply and the difficulty to invest. And the cycle in metals is good in both sides. Supply is limited and demand is going to explode. And final comments, uh, current valuations are not really aggressive at all. In mining, we are basically mid-cycle with a lot of fear on, on China and, and Omicron. And in, in oils, we are really well below, uh, not well below, no, but below mid-cycle. So still a lot of upside in, in 
both sectors. So on that aspect, we are not worried at all. So having said that, I hand over to, to Carlos that is going to talk about this chronic underinvestment in commodities. Okay, thank you, uh, Marcos. Just very quickly, because Marcos has, so gone, has been going through the main points, but I will try to make them a little bit more uh, general so that you can live with, with a long-term view of what happens in this very, um, this very volatile uh, sector or sectors. Well, first, as Marco has said, there has been very little investment in the last uh, 10, 12 years in the whole hard space. And it is interesting, we can generalize that, not just talking the, about commodities and uh, something else, but um, if you look at the famous SPACs, you know, this uh, kind of uh, highly speculative kind of IPOs that have, were fashionable in the US for the last two, three years. Uh, the cumulative investment in companies, which I would say 80% of them are strictly worth zero, has been $300 billion. I mean, it's not for lack of money that uh, people are not producing commodities. It is because there has been a very strong bias in the markets for the, that's been growing for the last, uh, I would say, 15 years towards what we could call immaterial investments. You know, you can see, uh, and the numbers are mind boggling. I mean, how much mal investment there has been this year. Companies uh, in the U.S. will spend $170 billion on streaming movies. Uh, th th that's kind of an abstract number, but if you realize that there are like 250 million uh, homes throughout the world that can actually pay for the fees for the streaming services, you realize that those guys are investing a thousand, I mean, almost a thousand dollars per family who is paying uh, whatever, $200 per month. I mean, it just does not make the slightest sense. And there's still a lot of malinvestment going on. Uh, you can see that in the next slide, for instance, uh, how the markets have, obviously that malinvestment doesn't happen because people are stupid. People are responding at what the market is telling them. There in pink, you see the, uh, you know, basically the S&P 500. Uh, and then uh, uh, you have in, in, in blue and violet, you have the uh, commodity returns uh, for the last 15 years. I mean, it makes quite a bit of a difference if you multiply your money by four or just increase it by 20%. Now, you can see, for instance, this is a very small example. You can see NVIDIA and TSNC. NVIDIA is uh, probably the leading world uh, manufacturer, not the seller of uh, microchips. And TSMC is the leading world manufacturer of the same uh, chips because NVIDIA, like Apple, for instance, and some other companies, they design the chips, they are their own chips, but they do not make them. They don't have the factories necessary to make them. Uh, now, NVIDIA trades now, after a big drop, by the way, at a P of almost 50, uh, which assumed, I mean, when you are paying a P of 50, you are obviously assuming huge growth in the future otherwise, why would you pay? You accept only 2% return on your investment. It's because you think that 2% is going to grow a lot. TSMC is trading at a P of less than five, uh, 15, sorry. Uh, now, the funny thing is, there is no way in the world NVIDIA can grow more than TSMC because TSMC makes the chips that NVIDIA sells. <laughs> and uh, the fact that uh, TSMC has to invest is already in the, in the results. Uh, because they amortize before the profit. So the market simply prefers to invest in these kinds of things. And well, and TSMC now has a nice uh, P of 15. It's been around 10 for years. Now Samsung Electronics, which is the other manufacturer, uh, has a P of 10. And uh, Hynix, uh, Micron, the other manufacturers have P's in the single digits. So uh, Marcos was mentioning Buse Unichem, I mean, Unichem. I mean, think for a second, that company has 10,000 employees, uh, makes 60 million tons of cement, which are absolutely necessary to the world, and it is worth $3 billion in the market. Now, there is a company in the US called Nikola that pretends to make electric trucks. They've never made a truck, 
they made, uh, you may know the story, they made a video of one of their trucks running very beautiful. And it turned out that it had been done in a downhill because the truck had no engine. So the company is a complete fraud and it has a market value today after all that fraud uh, came up of more than 3 billion. So the market still prefers to be uh, to own uh, Nikola than Bootsy uh, Unichem with its uh, 60 million other. So this malinvestment has uh, lasted a long time. And it's important to insist on that because otherwise the numbers we give on natural resources are simply unbelievable, <laughs> but they are true. Uh, uh, it's estimated that uh, to balance supply and demand in oil, people would need one point, uh, to invest 1.3 trillion dollars. If you add to that the necessary investments in uh, metals, we were talking about $2 trillion of investment that has not been made and has to be made. I mean, between the one that has not been made and the one that has to be made uh, over the next uh, few, I mean, we're talking here five, seven years, as Marco said, we're not talking here 2050. Uh, now, people are not going to give that kind of money uh, to, to this company unless the profitability is very high. And for profitability to be very high, prices have to be high. If prices were not high, companies would not make money and nobody would invest. So there would be no commodity. So the prices would be very high. Prices are going to be very high. Now, if you go to the, to the next uh, slide, as Marcos was saying, uh, this uh, is going to take a long time. And, and this is what people sometimes in financial uh, sectors do not understand. These are not SPACs. These are not investment banking tricks. I mean, these are real assets. Even if we had the $2 trillion today in the bank and said, okay, let's go, let's do it. It takes 15 years to build a mine. Even if you have all the money in the world, it just takes 15 years. Uh, and countries are still today not giving permit. That's bronzes is one of the biggest uh, copper mines in the world. They were supposed to double production the next, uh, starting now in the next few years. And the Peruvian government has just denied the permit because uh, of environmental, uh, on environmental grounds. So no blast bronzes uh, stage two. Uh, and the cost of capital is very high. People are afraid of investing in these things. I mean, now people say, okay, the Permian, uh, you know, the shale oil should, should produce more oil. Well, that's nice, but there are no pipelines available and absolutely nobody is going to invest in a pipeline if they do not have 20 year contracts, which is the time it takes to recover the investment. Now, who wants to give a 20 year contract now on oil production? And the answer is nobody. Uh, so the pipeline is not being made. So the oil production cannot increase. Now, in the next slide, we show just uh, trying, to, in trying to explain this, the best way to understand uh, these markets, which are very confusing to most people, is that there are three cycles that overlap. Now, the first cycle, which is the investment cycle, is the one we've been talking about, Marcos and myself. It depends on how much uh, capacity there is. Now, since capacity takes such a very long time to, uh, to increase, this is a very long time cycle. When there is not enough oil or enough copper, it takes 10, 15 years to make more available, which is fairly unique. You know, if people want SPACs, well, it takes a while, but in six months time, investment banks will sell you hundreds of SPACs. Well, they cannot sell you hundreds of mines. It cannot be done. Now, this is a very long cycle. And uh, it is a cycle that is a glaciation. You know, it just moves at its own rhythm and nothing that happens, nothing can affect it, can change it. You know, you can have the worst financial crisis in 100 years in 2008. Uh, you can have uh, the worst pandemic in 100 years. You can have a war in Europe. You can have it whatever you want, that the uh, supply and demand balance doesn't change uh, for the long term. Okay, so this is the cycle. Now, on this investment cycle, which has a span of 10, 15, 20 years, depending on the situation, the technology, you have to superimpose overlap uh, an economic cycle. Obviously, if there is a recession, uh, demand for these commodities, which is very stable, but it, go, it does go down marginally. Or if you have an unexpected boom, demand goes up. If you have a war in a producing country, uh, supply goes down, etc. So this 
things last between three months and a year and a half. Recessions do not last, last more than a half than one year. Uh, these wars, uh, whatever. I mean, we don't know. But now, on a big uh, on a big cycle, you have to overrun. You have to superimpose a shorter cycle, and this throws people off. You know, how can you be invested in copper if China is locking down industry? Well, but the lockdown is going to last three months, and the scarcity of copper is going to last fifteen years. Okay, so this cycle. It matters, but to a long-term investor, it's completely irrelevant. It's just a source of volatility. Now, that volatility is exaggerated by the third uh, cycle, which is which we call the financial cycle, which is you know people hedging, selling short, selling uh, buying long, doing all kinds of things, trying to profit from this volatility on the very short term. Now, this just exaggerates the volatility of uh, the prices that we see, but again, it has zero impact on the, the demand situation. Now, taking the case of oil right now, yesterday the European Union said they're going to ban oil imports from Russia, oil goes up 4%, well, fine. Um, one of these days, the thing in Russia, in Ukraine will finish one way or another. And that day you will see the oil price drop 25% because maybe, because people will say, well, now oil, Russian oil will come back. But that doesn't, uh, Neither one thing nor the other affects the fact that there is not enough oil in the world. So uh, we see a lot of volatility, but this is a, 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 an investment for the next 10, 15 years. Now, this time, uh, for as Marco was saying, because of ESG, because of decarbonization, blah, 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 this thing, this cycle is going to be even longer than in the past, uh, probably deeper than in the past. And uh, we're starting, so it is really the time. And by the way, if prices for many commodities do what we think they're going to do, uh, this is going to hurt other parts of the economy. So uh, it is important to be invested in the only part of the economy that's probably going to do well in the next few years. That's, uh, that's another point. Voila, that was our main uh, point on, uh, okay. on these cycles. Thanks, Alex. So I wanted to have a few words on a typical example, uh, and I want to show a little bit that it might not be that easy as it looks like uh, to increase production just because prices are high. So we made a recent uh, site visit in Spain of Atalaya Mining. Maybe, Alex, you could go to the next page. Uh, that's just uh, the, an overview of the of the of the of the of the map. So the mine is located uh, north of the towns of Huelva and Sevilla. Uh, it it uh, it's uh, exporting its ore to the main smelters of uh, Atlantic Copper, which is belonging to Freeport, which is uh, one of the big uh, biggest uh, copper smelters in Europe, and uh, it, it's uh, around an hour north drive of Huelva and Sevilla. Maybe to the next slide, Alex. So I thought it's quite a simple example to explain a few things because it's virtually a simple company with one mine. It produces a bit north of 50,000 tons of copper, has, uh, is mining below a uh, half percent grade, has at the moment around uh, 12 years mine life, has another project in Galicia, and obviously has uh, very good margins. The company came back into production, I think around five years ago. Maybe to the next slide, Alex. <clears throat> so you see uh, a situation just simply what is uh, the case in commodities. You see on spot prices, the company trades around uh, three times EVAP DAW based on based on a, on a spot price of copper of four and a half dollars per pound. And you see how, for example, in copper analysts are expecting the prices to decline, which is not as extreme in metals as in other commodities like oil, oil or even fish where the price on the spot market is virtually double than the expectations. So nobody knows exactly why people are expecting uh, prices to decline, given uh, Marcos and Carlos' uh, explanation, but that's just the case. So maybe to the next slide. 
So, so this is a bit uh, what happening is uh, in real life, you know, despite prices are high, for example, in these companies, the, the first uh, quarter was around minus 20% production because of a strike in transport and in mining. So, and, 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 and rule of thumb is that you're actually losing around 5% of the production of the installed capacity in average because of uh, all these problems, you know, strikes and wars and then a thousand other uh, thousand other risks what really is happening or does really happen so analysts are always uh, adding up uh, you know the, 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 the best case meaning everybody is producing at peak capacity but in real life you always have uh, in average around five percent production loss due to many many reasons maybe to the next slide Alex this is also something which always reminds me of a little anecdote same happened 20 years ago, having a meeting with the CEO of BHP Billiton, which was complaining about rising steel prices. Obviously, he's the biggest producer and exporter of iron ore and coke and coal, or even an energy company complaining about rising energy prices. So this is, of course, what's happening in this industry, which is very energy intense and obviously uses a, a particularly steel and other things. So you have a big cost inflation, which is now obviously uh, affecting virtually every company. And, uh, you know, and the uh, production is coming in below expectations. Of course, you cannot have the slides from Carlos and Marcos and explaining how the production of these commodities are rather going down or disappoint and then expecting all the companies, uh, you know, exceed the expectations in terms of production. Maybe to the next slide, Alex. And this is just what's happening a bit at the moment, which is might be which might be a bit different to to expectations because people think, you know, uh, because of high prices now everybody's optimistic. We have a lot of investments, and uh, this capex cycle is peak is, is 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 catching up. But actually, the opposite is happening. I just have a few headlines which shows a bit that the analysts are expect ex actually or the crowd is actually getting more bearish. In the, in the example of metals, it's even a bit more difficult in energy because there nobody ever got bullish at the first hand, so you cannot turn bearish. But now what's happening is, you know, you have this, uh, this, this production coming below estimates and obviously the costs are going up. So analysts are putting this into the models and obviously they, they start downgrading the stocks. But what should really be happening as well is that if you have all the companies reporting production below estimates, Somebody would have to adjust the demand supply copper model or oil model, but this is somebody else who, who is doing it. So on paper, these companies are getting uh, less attractive because the costs are going up, production is going down, but the commodity price, which obviously should be adjusted on the upside, is not getting adjusted. And this is the case for mining, energy, or even, even um, agricultural. So maybe the next slide, Alex. And then this is uh, maybe an example how how difficult or, or not as easy as it is to increase production. I mean, this is a company which has spare capacity in the processing plant, which obviously is a good thing to have because you have fixed fixed uh, investments which you could uh, you know which you could um, increase the the, 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 the throughput, etc. Maybe on the next slide. So the, the first and easiest thing, as we have seen on the on the valuation, is obviously you increase the throughput, that means, you know, you just produce more ore to be processed in the processing plant. This is, a, for example, the pit they are mining. But the problem is, you know, nobody wants to do this because what really adds value to a project is increasing the asset life. So it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make any sense to cannibalize the mine life, you know, start processing or mining more ore and then just increase the production but then shortening the mine life. So this is not really an incentive for a mining company. Maybe the next slide, Alex. And then in the, in the case of uh, Otalaya, you have, uh, you know, uh, ore bodies, which are, which are uh, relatively nearby and, and actually quite easy to, easy to uh, process and transport. But, you know, this is, for example, an example of the tailing stem, and they have an ore body which I think is 20 kilometers plus away, but even that would need another tailing stem, and you see how big this is, and obviously this is always a concern for the environment, and, you know, you need processing, uh, permitting, etc. So, you know, in real life, 
this is not as easy to expand production as it looks like on, on, on a spreadsheet. And even the companies and the investors are not that keen on, on doing it. So despite the, despite the fact that the price is obviously good, but the risks are very high. And often, you know, as we as, as we do as investors, we just prefer to keep the operation running smooth and probably not really taking that more risk in terms of trying to expand production, at least not as quickly as people might think it's going to happen. <clears throat> and maybe on the next slide, Alex, this is a typical a slide we always try to show a bit, which is our, our mindset. So we like to be close to cash flow or in cash flow. And what also happens in a commodity cycle is that the replacement value goes up of the installed base, because of course you have capex inflation and cost inflation. So every project on paper is actually getting more expensive. But if you have already built the mine, bought the caterpillar trucks, etc., it's actually the companies which are benefiting most. So we think this is exactly what's happening, which is, of course, then lifting on structurally the, the prices because marginal projects get, get much more expensive than uh, people thought they will. And maybe the, the next slide, Alex, this is a, an interesting slide in the, in the, in the case of Atalaya, maybe in the private equity world. Mozza is a, is a similar company nearby, which is obviously, as you can see, not in our opinion as good as Atalaya in terms of copper reserves, grades, mine life. And this is a company which was sold by Trafigura to an Australian, they call it the exploration company. And you see in terms of transaction value, uh, they paid uh, virtually double the price than the valuation of Atalaya for an asset, which is probably not as good. I mean, it's not expensive neither in absolute terms. You, you, they paid uh, below five times EV EBITDA, but it shows a bit how cheap uh, in our sector the, the quoted uh, companies are, even in comparison to um, transactions which are happening in the sectors in terms of in terms of M and A. I think I hand back to Alex with this. Thanks a lot, Tours. Now the situation is that I would like actually to, to just conclude with a couple of slides. Uh, the first slide is uh, uh, very well known of most of you. We just updated actually at the end of uh, April, the see-through profitability of the fund on the classic fund. We show here that we are actually trading at the P of 12.1 times, 2.6% uh, dividend yield and the price to book of two. And on all the metrics, we are substantially more attractive than, than, the, than the general market. And what we indicated already before is that if you look further ahead, 23, 24, we have the issue that the commodity analysts are actually not taking the, the spot price into consideration. They, of course, take the future price into consideration, which is substantially lower. And if you have listened to Marcos, Carlos, and Urs, you realize that it's quite irrealistic to believe that the future prices is going to be much, much lower than the current spot price. So all in all, we believe it's a very attractive valuation. Now let's look at the performance. Since uh, we changed our uh, portfolio construction in 2011, we have actually achieved 10.9% uh, per year, which I think is a very attractive uh, performance over, over these almost 11 years now. The situation is, of course, that we have underperformed the growth part of the markets, but that we have explained also in very much detail. Now, on the Natural Resources Fund, we compare ourselves here with the S&P Natural Resources Fund uh, index. And here you see that we are high beta. So basically in negative markets, we are losing more than the index, but in the positive markets, we go up quite a bit more. And you see that very much pronounced in the next slide. So basically since the trough in COVID in March, 2020, we performed 205% and we outperformed this index by more than 50%. Now, with that, I think you would like to go to Q and A's. And we have received the first questions already during the presentation over the chat. And I would like to tell everybody that if you have additional questions, please feel free now to type in your questions uh, or 
that's that's for us probably the best way uh, because otherwise it's a bit complex because we have actually 50 people in the in the audience which is fantastic now the first question i have been asked was uh, should somebody invest rather in a classic or in a natural resources fund? And that's a, you know, a question we are oft asked quite often. And my usual answer is, uh, I buy, for instance, for my kids, I buy the classic. For myself, I have 80% in the classic and 20% in the natural resources. In other words, for investors that are not really willing to take too much risk, I think the classic offers a better product, but if somebody really is after the natural resources exposure, I think, and that on a pure one, because also the classic has 25% natural resources exposure, or even slightly more now because of performance, uh, is, is basically just two differences. So I would, I would really argue like that. So basically for old grandmothers, they probably would rather prefer the classic, or for a long-term investor that want to be very, very stable money, and on, on the other side, if you want to have a certain protection within an existing portfolio against inflation, or if you want to protect your purchasing power in the coming years, then adding the natural resources is for sure a good idea. Uh, we have received another question, and then maybe uh, would like to pass that on to Urs. Uh, George Hafner asked the question on uranium. Urs? Um, what's the question, Alex? I... Uh, what about the uranium market? I mean, on the on the demand supply. Yeah, that's a very similar picture than uh, in many other commodities. I mean, uranium is a very simple commodity in terms it has only uh, two kind of usages, which is uh, nuclear warheads and uh, power production. I mean, the demand side now people are getting a bit, uh, you know, uh, maybe carried away about this news that. Uh, you know, obviously, we have to invest in nuclear power, but that at the end, uh, for the next 10 years, I think it won't have really an effect on the end use because you have around 10% uh, of existing nuclear fleet in, in construction, like always, mostly in Asia and so on. So this will add uh, you, maybe 2% annually to the demand. But the problem is uranium has one of the biggest uh, demand supply gaps in terms of mine production. I mean, pre-COVID, pre I mean, we had around a market which was around 200 million pounds soon on the demand side annually and around 120 million pounds of, uh, of mine production. And, uh, you know, this is virtually a deficit of nearly 50 uh, percent or the other way around 100 percent. So I've hardly seen a commodity where the mine production is so low in terms of the historical or the actual use. And the reason is that a lot of this uh, deficit was filled by uh, above ground stockpiles or mostly by the by the de decommissioning of uh, russian nuclear warheads which is uh, <laughs> quite obviously over <laughs> and uh, and you know there's not enough uranium going to be around and uh, yeah so i think it's a similar uh, situation like in all the other commodities you have had a huge under investments utilities uh, didn't uh, didn't contract uranium on the on the on the on the term market because spot prices was much lower but now they have to get this uranium this uranium is not existing so um, yeah we have a, a big demand supply gap like you know most commodities for the coming years thanks a lot tours uh, then a question for marcos that was also on the chat uh, marcos uh, on harbor energy uh, it seems that the, the stock is lagging a bit, the energy market. Uh, would you agree with that? I mean, it has doubled. It has not done that badly, but but, but what's your main opinion on that? Yeah, I think uh, hardware, as, as you all know, is an old uh, investment for, for our fund. It was a uh, premier oil that merged with Chrysler. And in this merger, we had a lot of uh, forced sellers. So, you know, bondholders, equity holders that were forced to sell because they didn't want to be in the space after the merger. So this has been dragging the stock for, oof, for two years. Uh, so the stock has been really, really depressed. And the lockups uh, ended in, if I'm not wrong, in April. And uh, this is helping the stock to recover. So once the lockups are over, and the stock is now trading more on a free way, it has started to move up. So it has been this year, I think it's already up like 40 or 50%. Uh, 
And according to our numbers, this is still extremely cheap. We have a kind of mid-cycle valuation of 650, and the stock is below, below five pounds. So we have still a, a good upside to mid-cycle, and the peak cycle is close to a thousand. So uh yeah i think it was some technical reasons from a fundamental perspective production costs uh, managers balance sheet everything is is looking really really good and you know we've spoken to them several times and they have impressed us we think that the management team is a very very disciplined and reliable team which is very good in this sector thanks a lot marcus and then there was a question also on the book value of the classic i mean we have uh, we are trading at a two times book there was a comment that it's not really that cheap any longer but i mean if you compare that with the nasdaq the nasdaq has a book value of five and there you have companies that have a, a, a totally silly book value so i believe that that our book value of of of, of two times uh actually is, is is quite decent because don't forget Alex, so if, have if i may and the like in the portfolio yes carlos yeah, if I may add, I mean, don't compare it just to the Nasdaq, which obviously inflated, but, you know, the world average as the, the MSCI World Index shows in our slide is 2.7. So we're a third below the world average, including all companies in the world. So two uh, times is not high at all. And actually, absolutely. And then we have the combination of the Unilevers also in our portfolio that have in tendency also quite a bit higher, higher uh, book value. Then there is another question, maybe for you, Marcus. Uh, what's for us a good management team? Just on the before talking about this, just a, a quick uh, specification on the book. Return on equity of the fund, you, you can calculate more or less there. The EPS for the next two years, this is consensus. What we put in the in the in the look through, we put EPS and book per share. So you can calculate the return on equity of the fund. If you do a spot, you know, mark, mark to market is, is higher than 20%. Historically, uh, higher uh, ROE, uh, ROE, higher than 20% deserves a price to book of around three times. So this is just a minor uh, explanation. Then a good management, you know, good management uh, is something that is very difficult to guess at the first meeting. We've been trapped in many, many, many <laughs> cases with uh, management that either lied to us or were overselling their stuff. So it takes time. And you know what we used to do is, is very disciplined. We try to speak to them. We then try to cross check with the sell side. Then we try to cross check with experts. And even with that, some of them uh, can, you know, even uh, lead us to, to some mistakes. So we then build on expertise and on, on experience. What does this mean? That normally we don't invest directly in a company that we have just learned about, okay? We meet the management for the first time. We like the story. It is cheap, blah, blah. We put it in the watch list. And then it stays as the watch list, I don't know, for six quarters or for one year, for whatever, because we are not in a rush. The portfolio is built. So this means that we need really to talk to them three, four, five times see how things are working and and then and then we rate them as a good management or not and you know in the commodities space you wouldn't believe uh, the quality of management because you know bear in mind that they are trying to sell uh, projects some of them have not even capital some of them are just a pure excel sheet so you really need to be very strong in terms of filtering the good management the bad management and more not being a geologist, you know, than this, you know, to, to end this comment, we've been there 25, 30 years, each of us, which means that basically we have a lot of track record in the past uh, of having been talking to all these guys. And then, of course, we also try to double check with uh, with people then that are from the industry and that are geologists. To conclude, because we are just passing the hour, uh, I would like to 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 uh, show here uh, the future events that we have on our agenda. So uh, Marcos will be in Bilbao on the 2nd of June on an event called Buscando Valor. A day later, he will be in Madrid for Value Spain. Uh, we will have uh, our first Swiss Value Day in Zurich uh, on the 10th of June, together with our friendly competitors, Brown Fundies. And we will have three company CEOs coming as well to the event. 
uh, 21st of June, we'll be in Mannheim doing a lunch presentation uh, during the fun professional days. Uh, then 16th of September, we'll have our Natural Resources Day in Zurich that we'll do since five years. And last but not least, we will have our Frankfurt event on the 22nd of September. With that, we would like to conclude and say thanks a lot. <coughs> and please stay healthy. And we will look forward to meet you all in the next possibility. If you have a question, please do not hesitate to call us for any question that you may have. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.